The final item of business today is the Members' Business Debate on Motion Number 14109 in the name of Mike McKenzie on Community Energy Fortnight 2015. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would be grateful if those members who wish to speak in the debate could press the request to speak buttons now. I call on Mike McKenzie to open the debate. Seven minutes, please, Mr McKenzie. Thank you, President Officer. I'm delighted to have secured this debate as an opportunity to highlight the significant contribution made by communities across the Highlands and Islands and indeed the rest of Scotland in ushering in a new energy future for Scotland, a future that is brighter, cleaner and greener than the past, a future we have, where we have greater energy resilience and security and a future that is less dependent on a few big companies as the sole providers of energy. I share the Scottish Government's vision for a future where communities are empowered in every sense of the word, not just politically, but also economically. Able to invest in and develop their own community assets and opportunities, and community energy projects are an obvious opportunity. Capturing the benefits of renewable energy and producing funding streams, which in, which in turn will empower other projects in a virtuous spiral that has enabled many communities to tackle local problems more effectively than they could be tackled by other agencies. That's why I'm so glad that the Scottish Government has set ambitious target for community and locally owned renewables of 500 megawatts by 2020. And that's why I'm so glad that thanks to the efforts of the small businesses and communities all over the country, we are well over halfway towards meeting that target. And that's why I'm also glad when the Scottish Government set up and invested in the CARES Loan Fund to de-risk the early pre-planning stages of community renewable projects. President Officer, my own passion for community-owned renewables began when the Dancing Ladies of Gia, Scotland's first community-owned wind turbines, were erected in 2003. I was then a board member of my own community's development trust, and I was lucky enough to be invited along with representatives from community organisations all over Scotland to attend a conference over a weekend in GIA to learn from their experience. The generosity of the GIA folk in sharing their hard-won knowledge and their generous hospitality and what was a wonderful weekend are etched in my memory. One further thing, not quite so positive, also remains etched in my memory. The local planning officer who dealt with the application gave a presentation. He started his talk to the 200 or so good folk in the audience by saying in tones of bureaucratic bombast that there were only two words in the planner's lexicon, no and maybe. I was as shocked as the majority of the listeners. I agree with them that there should be two words that guide our planners and these two words undoubtedly should be yes and maybe. I touch on this because it's often negotiating the hurdles within our planning system that are the first hurdles that are experienced by communities considering renewable energy projects. And that's why I'm pleased that the First Minister announced a root and branch review of our planning system two weeks ago when Parliament resumed. Because our planning system should be the midwife of sustainable development. And community renewable energy projects are often the embodiment of the principles of sustainable development. And such community renewable projects need the assistance and not the resistance of local planners. But we've come a long way since the Dancing Ladies of Gia were first erected. I was particularly pleased to see the successful deployment of the world's first community-owned tidal generator off the Shetland Island of Yale last summer. The developers of the device Nova Innovation are due much credit, not least because tw at least 25% of the total development expenditure was spent on Shetland, with, for example, the small local business Shetland Composites manufacturing the carbon fibre turbine blades. There are many, many more good examples of community-owned renewable projects, many of them aimed at tackling fuel poverty 
or paying for the badly needed renovation of local homes, as the community on Guy are doing. There are many, many, certainly. Jamie McGregor. Could we have Mr McGregor's microphone, please? Mr McGregor, do you have your card in? Many thanks, Jamie McGregor. So on that point, um, the, um, the member makes the point about the, uh, the dancing ladies of gear and the money that they bring in. But why does he think that the gear community uh, is in uh, such a bad way financially, despite that? Mike McKenzie, I'll give you your time back. I don't necessarily accept the proposition that the gear community is in a bad way financially. Um, often communities have to borrow money and uh, you, there are times when you, when you look at their balance sheet properly where you realise, yes, there's a bit of borrowing, but overall they're actually in a good uh, situation. And I, I think the, the people in GIA are due great credit in being prepared to shoulder some risk in borrowing money to advance their projects. So I don't necessarily accept that view that they're in a bad uh, financial situation. But there are many, many more possibilities for further uh, community-owned renewable energy projects. And I would be remiss, presiding officer, if I did not say that future projects are threatened by the UK government energy policy, by a UK government which is forsaking renewable energy in favour of nuclear power, by a UK government that's failed to invest in the necessary upgrades of the grid infrastructure, necessary to allow renewable energy projects to develop, by a UK government that's significantly reducing feed-in tariffs as well as bringing the ROC scheme to a close early. Presiding officer, it's important to realise that it's not just onshore wind projects that are threatened by these energy policies. All renewable energy technologies are threatened. It's time that the full powers over energy are devolved to this Parliament so that the Scottish Government can continue to support Scotland's communities in harvesting the benefits of local community energy. Thank you. We now turn to the open debate. Speeches of four minutes or so, please. And I call Sarah Boyack to be followed by Murdo Fraser. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Well, I want to congratulate Mike uh, Mackenzie for securing this debate tonight. I think it's both timely and important. I very much welcome his motion. And in celebrating Community Energy Fortnight 2015, we should record a celebration of the fact that there are 144 projects that we know about that bring in communities around the region of £10 million of benefit every single year. That is absolutely something to celebrate. I think I want to highlight that renewable energy and energy efficiency should go together. And particularly for rural communities where people are living in hard to heat homes, one of the big benefits of community energy schemes has been for the capacity for communities to help reinvest in the housing stock in their areas. And not just to create new energy that people can draw on, but also to reduce the amount of energy that they actually need to consume. And it's that win-win that I think we need to highlight. There is a fuel poverty in crisis, so it's partly about the supply of energy being owned at the community level and the opportunity of community cooperatives, but it's also about the retrofitting of people's existing homes. And from, um, no, I want to crack on, I've only got two and a half minutes, Mike. Um, so I want to congratulate Mike. I want to particularly welcome the coalition because it's an important coalition with the knowledge on environmental campaigning and experience that comes from Friends of the Earth, I say that as a member, with the expertise that comes from the Energy Savings Trust, with the knowledge about our buildings that comes from the National Trust for Scotland, and from the National Union of Students, many of whose members are living in incredibly expensive rented accommodation with really, really bad energy efficiency standards. That is a powerful combination um, to lobby for change. I would very much agree with the comments that were made about the retrograde step that there is with the renewables obligation and the feed-in tariff being dramatically reduced at the UK level. 
It is already jeopardising investment in renewables projects, and that is something we should be campaigning against and um, pushing the UK government to change. I don't think anyone would dispute the fact that mature technologies, as the costs come down, we can reduce the subsidy and target on the newer, innovative renewables that we want to see. But the cavalier approach that's been taken puts jobs at risk. So I hope that we can work together to get that changed. Now, as a former planner, I want to agree with Mike that there is more that can be done on planning. But one of the biggest things that we could have done in this parliament over the last 10 years would have been to remove the requirement for planning applications on small scale applications, permitted development rights, I've been campaigning on this for over a decade now. It was in my Members' Bill. It was something I campaigned for in the 2009 Climate Change Act. It sounds like a small thing, but the red tape that is tied up in people having to apply for planning permission for solar PV, for small projects on their houses, has meant that many people have not gone through the planning process because of the cost, and that's something we could fix instantly. So, I would like to ask the Minister, is that something he will now act on as Energy Minister? It would be, you know, we've, there's so many people have missed out on the opportunity of feed-in tariff, but if the Minister could make that statement, it would give some support to the emergent community projects. I'd like to see more on community projects supported by the Scottish Government. There are many more that we'd like to see moving ahead. I myself have visited projects in Edinburgh and Fife and Gia, Aberdeen, South Lanarkshire and Glasgow. And the most recent community energy project in uh, the Harlow Energy Project in the Balerno area of Edinburgh will make a real difference in terms of energy production but it will also give a benefit to the shareholders. And surely that is something that we should be encouraging across the country. Benefits for individuals, benefits for communities, and reinvesting in green jobs. We need more of that in Scotland. And let's hope that the Community Energy Fortnight will raise awareness and raise political support for action both in Scotland and at the UK level. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Many thanks. Before we move on, though, can I just remind members to use full names, please? It's important for the official report and for the public watching proceedings. Um, I do have a wee bit of time in hand if members care to take uh, interventions, but it is, of course, members' choice. Murdo Fraser, to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and welcome back. Um, can I start by congratulating Mike McKenzie on securing this debate and welcome the opportunity to support his motion? I thought Mr McKenzie made a very good speech. Uh, as you might expect, I didn't agree with all of it, and we'll come to the point of disagreement uh, later, but I thought you made the case uh, very well. Um, I'm very pleased to support uh, the principle of community energy. The first community energy fortnight was held in 2013, and it has become in a short space of time an established fixture in the calendar. I'm sure all members can point to community projects in their own areas which have been a success. I'd just like to mention two in my own region, uh, the first is the Leavenmouth Community Project at Methyl in Fife, which was awarded £4.3 million from the Local Energy Scotland Challenge Fund in July. This is located at the hydrogen office in Methyl and will generate renewable energy for use in creating hydrogen gas to run a fleet of up to 25 hydrogen vehicles. The scheme will use hydrogen as an energy store for grid balancing on the local energy park. And given the growing interest in energy storage, it's encouraging to see such an innovative project being supported. The second project I would highlight is the hydroelectric scheme at Callender in Stirlingshire. This was a 425 kilowatt scheme on the Stank Burn, built with over £2 million worth of grants and loans, and hoping to generate around 1.3 million kilowatt hours of energy per year for the next 20 years. And I think these are both good examples of the sort of projects that are being supported. Now, I suppose it was inevitable during this debate that there would be some criticism of the recent moves by the UK government to reduce subsidies uh, for wind power announced earlier in the year. And I know we'll have the opportunity to debate this issue in more detail uh, on Thursday, so I'd just like to simply point out to members and remind them that these are reforms which have been wildly wel widely welcomed by many communities uh, across Scotland. The economist Tony Mackay has it calculated that the level of subsidy for onshore wind power was between 2.5 and three times higher than that that was actually necessary. 
the result being that consumers have been paying higher bills for too long to support wind projects which should have been sustainable on a much lower level of subsidy. So I welcome the initiative that the UK Government has taken, which will deliver lower bills to consumers and again highlight the need for a more balanced energy policy. Now I have two specific issues I wanted to raise in connection with the KRES Fund, which Mike McKenzie uh, referred to. And I should say I support the principle that community projects enjoying local support are able to be assisted in this manner. But I do think it, that it's important that what are badged as community projects are in fact that, and not just a means of developers trying to increase their chances of getting consent for schemes. I am aware of two specific examples which have been drawn to my attention in different parts of the country, one very close uh, to where I live, where commercial projects have been promoted by developers and have then attracted very strong opposition, and these have effectively then been rebadged as community projects with the help of sympathetic individuals living in the area. But of course, the same level of opposition still exists. I believe that a community project, in order to attract financial support from the CARES Fund, which of course is taxpayers' money, should be able to demonstrate that it does have very strong community support. And the second point is a related one, because in that I'm aware of payments have been made in the past from the CARES scheme for community developments, but where in fact there's been very substantial community opposition to what is being proposed. So the community development is promoted by a very small minority of individuals within the community and faces substantial opposition. Uh, if I have time, I'm happy to give way, yeah. Mike right, McKenzie. Would you accept that some uh, projects are of a, of a scale or a complexity that mean that it wouldn't be feasible for communities to take them forward on their own, but it's perfectly valid for communities to do so in partnership with commercial developers? Madhu I, I, I don't disagree with that intervention, but I think Mr McKenzie rather misses the point I'm making, which is that if it's a community project, it must be able to demonstrate community support. And what's been very galling in the past is for the, the, the majority of a local community who are opposed to a development to see their money as taxpayers being used to fund a planning application which they are then having to oppose without any commensurate public support for their opposition. And it seems to me there's a very simple way to cure this problem, which is to require community projects, before they can attract financial support, to demonstrate uh, that they have substantial local support, perhaps with the support of the community council or perhaps through a local referendum before they're able to access public funds. I hope that this is something the Scottish Government would be prepared to look into further. With these caveats, Deputy Presiding Officer, I am happy to support the development of community energy and the good work that is going on. And I would close by again commending Mike McKenzie for securing this debate. Many thanks. And I now call Liam MacArthur to be followed by Alison Johnston. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy President. Also, can I join others in, in congratulating Mike McKenzie uh, on securing this debate, one that enables us to put on record our collective uh, support for community energy fortnight and our thanks to uh, those involved in the Community Energy Coalition. Uh, given there will be an opportunity on Thursday to pick up more general issues in relation to renewable energy, I, I will focus my brief remarks this evening on some specific aspects of community energy. And firstly, I think picking up a theme that Murdo Fraser was worrying away at uh, at the end of his remarks, I, I would reiterate that there is a distinction between community and local energy. Both undoubtedly have an important uh, part to play, but there's a danger in Scottish ministers setting an overall target for both that the two somehow become conflated. They are different, they deliver different benefits. And I can understand some of the concerns raised by Murdo Fraser, even if I, I don't entirely share them. Community ownership and coordinated action on energy uh, are a powerful means of embedding renewable energy, energy efficiency and local value into our communities. They also provide practical grassroots initiatives that help transform communities through enabling people to take responsibility. The Shapensey Development Trust's Winter Agri-Energy Project, quoted in the uh, Local Energy Scotland uh, briefing, uh, is an excellent example uh, in just one of the islands in my constituency with a good track record in this regard. And I, I see this reflected not just in Shapensey, but in a wide range of different projects uh, in Orkney, which I think provides a good, but by no means perfect illustration of a mixed economy when it comes to renewables. 
I'll come to more of these in a moment, including potential opportunities for matching local supply and demand more effectively and productively than happens at present. First, though, I must reflect on the problems created, as Mike McKenzie alluded to, uh, for community energy in, in Orkney by the continued limits uh, of grid capacity. As one constituent with intimate knowledge of these issues uh, observed to me recently, the requirement for community projects to be actively managed on a non-firm grid connection calls into question their commercial viability. The active management system was an innovative solution to sweat the local grid asset but appears now to be curtailing development despite strong community demand and support. Being more innovative in identifying local sources of demand would help, of course. For example, the heating system for the replacement Balfour Hospital in Kirkwall must make maximum use of installed renewables already in place. Anything less, I would suggest to the Minister, would be not just a missed opportunity, but a costly dereliction of duty on this key landmark project. Meanwhile, a recent ORF audit uh, funded by Community Energy Scotland and undertaken by Aquaterra showed marine diesel is the biggest fuel use in Orkney. Again, the inevitable replacement, this time of, inter -island of the inter-island ferry fleet, offers an opportunity to test, learn and demonstrate the use of renewables through hydrogen as a renewable sourced fuel. Similar to the uh, case highlighted by Murdo Fraser earlier, the local council and Community Energy Scotland are on the case with the Surf and Turf project with government funding, using hydrogen to run the ships tied up at the quay and training mariners in using hydrogen, preparing them in turn for the impending hydrogen economy. Good innovative projects that would ease grid constraints for other community projects while utilising local resources and developing a local skills base. Community action also uh, offers scope to more effectively tackle fuel poverty, including extreme fuel poverty, where Orkney sits top of the table nationwide. Thaw and its predecessor bodies have done excellent work looking at linking local generation with local affordable uh, warmth, including affordable tariffs. And while this is a highly regulated area, I'm in no doubt that there are opportunities here with the right support to make a real difference in addressing this scourge on my community and in our society. Finally, Deputy Presiding Officer, we've seen recently that without the restraint of Liberal Democrats and Coalition, the UK Tory government are quite happy to cut support for renewables. One, uh, one effect of this is to ensure that around £100 million of community-based renewable projects will not now go ahead. Can I therefore urge the Minister to press his UK counterpart for genuine financial differentiation for so-called community fits? I'm sure this would make a difference in helping deliver more of the sorts of projects that are at the heart of Community Energy Fortnight and deliver the wide range of benefits that I have seen firsthand in Orkney. Thank you very much indeed. Many thanks. And I now call Alison Johnston to be followed by Chick Brodie. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to take part in this debate during Community Energy Fortnight, and I thank Mike McKenzie for giving us the opportunity to, to debate this topic this evening. Um, I welcome the focus in the motion on energy efficiency too, not just the promotion of renewable energy, as we can't benefit fully from investment in, in energy if we don't have wind-tight, water-tight, well-insulated homes. And as we've heard, Community Energy Fortnight celebrates community-owned renewable energy projects and it aims to promote communities owning and generating energy together. Presiding officer, I believe that we can't overstate the importance of this topic and that it can and should form a, a more central plank of our energy policy. As Friends of the Earth say in their briefing, in the context of climate change and the historical carbon debt of industrialised countries, a renewable energy transition is imperative. But it's clear that this essential transition has many potential benefits. Renewables lend themselves to community ownership in a way that other fossil fuels don't, in the way that nuclear doesn't, in a way that unconventional gas won't. Community-owned renewables can help us address the power imbalance that promotes inequality in the current system, which is centralised and inflexible, and it's resulted in the monopoly of big six companies. Scotland is energy rich, but access to this abundance isn't as equitable as it should be. And even the World Bank has recognised that business as usual will not remotely suffice to meet the goals of clean and universal energy. We will, of course, on hearing such a statement, think of the one billion plus people in developing countries who live without access to electricity. But we should also consider those who suffer from extreme fuel poverty here in Scotland. 
Earlier this year at Energy Action Scotland's conference, we learned that 71% of homes in the Western Isles are regarded as being in fuel poverty. Are many benefits to enabling willing communities in Scotland to play an important role in meeting carbon, renewables and climate change targets not worth fighting for? I do believe that there is a universal will in this Parliament to demand change and to demand investment in this important area. I am um, a shareholder in Harlow Hydro and it has much in common with other projects that we have heard about this evening. And this learning that these small projects are, are gaining, it will be shared. The pathways to such projects will be smoother. The projects can share stumbling blocks. They can develop their understanding of the Department for Energy's websites. They can discuss next steps. And most importantly, they can discuss their successes. We know two projects that have tried to get off the ground in Portobello and Leith. The Water of Leith is looking at hydro feasibility at the moment. But we're on track currently to deliver almost twice as much renewable energy from community renewables as the Scottish Government's target of 2020 of 500 megawatts. So let's increase that target to one gigawatt and let's aim for two by 2030 because there's so many benefits if we commit to and invest in delivering clean, low carbon energy. There are local employment opportunities, community development funds and fuel poverty alleviation. If we look at what's happening in Denmark, for example, they have a right to invest legislation and that requires developers to offer 20% ownership of wind projects um, to local communities. 70 to 80%, an incredible figure of wind turbines in Denmark are under some form of community ownership. They have the world's first island that's entirely renewably powered. 11 onshore and 10 offshore turbines. And it's this bottom-up approach that has enabled that, that community to invest in the things that are important to them, whether it's a 3G football pitch, whether it's a youth club, whether, as Sarah Boyack mentioned, it's better housing. But, you know, they're a fantastic example. In Denmark and in Germany, citizens and communities have been the driving force for not only the development of renewable energy as a revolution, but their acceptance as well. And that is very, very important. I'd maybe just like to remind Murdo Fraser that fossil fuels receive billions of pounds of public subsidy, an ongoing situation, and certainly many of the constituents who write to me would like to see that transferred into the clean, green, low-carbon technology of the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call Chick Brodie to be followed by Claudia Beamish. Yeah, thank you, Presiding Officer. <clears throat> May I, too, uh, thank Mike McKenzie for bringing the debate to the Chamber this evening. Um, Mike's a great champion uh, of renewables uh, and uh, combined with communities, particularly rural communities. Uh, and some of us have learned a lot from, uh, from Mike. As the motion says, our local community projects play a vital role in meeting our carbon and renewables targets, but, but they also make a major contribution to the overall economic performance uh, of rural areas and the country generally. And it's not just about wind. The term community energy is used in a variety of different contexts, including electricity generation, grid relationship and collective purchasing power. Uh, not so much community ben benefits, which uh, not all that long ago were seen to be somewhat narrow, divisive and not necessarily directed to longer term returns on investment in, in communities. I believe, uh, presiding officer, that there have to be certain common characteristics in any community energy scheme. For example, one, ordinary people involved in managing and running uh, the projects through cooperatives or development trusts and being able to access uh, the required finance to uh, allow them to set up their projects. Two, uh, where there is a democratic and uh, non-corporate structure. And we, three, where there can be tangible local outcomes for people living or working close to the projects themselves. And four, the profits then go back to the community or are reinvested in other community energy schemes. There's a bit of a, an analogy between wind turbines and the revolving door uh, for community investment. Of course, the Community Empowerment Bill supports local energy companies also in achieving their goals. The main policy goal of the bill empowers community bodies through the ownership of land and buildings and strengthening their voices in decisions uh, that matter to them, no less than on energy provision. 
uh, as has been mentioned, the planning process is also important in this area. And perhaps all schemes should be mandated uh, to ensure they hold pre-application discussions with local communities to allow extensive and inclusive decision, discussions to take place around community ownership, co-ownership, rewards and benefits. The government, as we know, is our government has set an ambitious target of the equivalent of 100% demand for electricity being met from our renewable sources by 2020. There's also a target of 500 megawatts uh, through locally owned schemes, again targeted for 2020. The Scottish Government uh, has uh, assisted community projects through the Community and Renewable Energy Scheme, the Renewable Energy Infrastructure Fund and the uh, £20 million Local Energy Fund. There are some great examples of local schemes throughout Scotland, but there are opportunities for many more. Community Energy Scotland is, of course, a registered charity which aims to build confidence, resilience and wealth at a community level through sustainable energy development. And in their submission to the Smith Commission, it highlighted significant obstacles to realising uh, this potential. There is considerable scope also for innovation through smarter grid management, local supply chain arrangements and smarter approaches to demand management. The biggest obstacle, however, is that all main incentives for renewable energy development for renewables are, of course, reserved and controlled by Westminster. We suggest that the new centralised contracts for difference makes it much harder indeed for community projects to access because of its cost and complexity. What is essential is that the power to determine and set renewable energy incentive policies, levels and licences should be fully devolved, enabling the Scottish Parliament and Government to apply an effective development regime to meet Scottish requirements and in tandem uh, uh, with the Community Empowerment Bill, uh, which would certainly help achieve the objective. Local authorities should be encouraged to demonstrate leadership by working and supporting local community groups. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, community energy projects play a vital role in employment, in building physical and social capital, in com combating fuel poverty and, of course, in helping Scotland reach its renewable energy targets. We should do all we can to support existing schemes and encourage new schemes across Scotland. Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. And our final open debate speaker before I call the Minister is Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I too want to thank Mike McKenzie for bringing this significant debate to the Chamber today and for the comprehensive briefing which he and his office also provided. And I want to recognise the contribution of the Scottish Community Energy Coalition in Community Energy Fortnight 2015. The, the development of community energy is a climate justice issue, as Alison Johnson has also touched on, not only globally in the lead up to the Paris summit, but here in Scotland itself as I've stressed on a number of occasions previously. From rural to urban, there are many different models for community energy to enable power and warm homes for our people. Friends of the Earth briefing, Community Power Building on Success, draws attention to, I quote, the recent European energy package, which talks of putting citizens at the heart of energy transition. As a member, of the Scottish Parliament Cooperative Group of MSPs, I want to start by highlighting the value of cooperative models in this context. Energy for All, one of the coalition members, has been a key player in this regard. The spirit of Lanarkshire in my own region, the Wind Energy Co-op, is now fully up and running, and I was at the launch uh, with the former MP, Tom Greatrix, who was supportive of it as well. Having raised 2.7 million in 2013, both developments, Nutbury near Colburn and West Browncastle near Straven are now fully on stream. Despite relatively poor wind speeds in some cases and some technical issues, the, the 906 members of the cooperative have just enjoyed a return of 7.63% for the period up to March 2015 and the board of the co-op is now looking for ways to use some of the profits to support local communities in the coming years. In an urban context, the Edinburgh Community Solar Cooperative launch will take place at the end of this month, and I, I wish that group well as well uh, and in commending the cooperative model. Some, some of the cooperative models are for part of a, a larger multinational 
uh, wind farm development and others are per se in their own right uh, working together in their communities. Uh, the other point I want to make in this short um, time I have left is I want to take a step back and look at the potential of the land reform bill uh, in relation to community energy in the future. In the past, I visited Dumfries House and along with Douglas and Angus Estate and a number of estates across Scotland, uh, they have installed biomass boilers, which tenants get a benefit from. And in this, their submission to the Rural Affairs Committee, uh, the Druleg Estate points out, and I quote, I'm about to sell, to, so I'm so sorry, <laughs> if only, I'm about to let three acres of ground to a company who plan to install mini hydro schemes to generate electricity. This will not just benefit us at the lodge, but the residents of Letterfern as well. My view of the proposed land reform bill is that it will be of no advantage to Scotland to remove certain land from landlords for it to be managed by local communities. NHS Health Scotland's 2012 to 17 corporate strategy a fairer, healthier Scotland has a very different view. And in, in its submission to the Rural Affairs Committee, NHS Health, Health Scotland sets out that our vision of Scotland in which all of our people and communities have a fairer share of the opportunities, resources and confidence to live longer and healthier lives. And I quote again, several case studies where Scottish land has transferred to community ownership have highlighted a number of potential benefits. For example, community ownership of land in rural areas has enabled investment in local resources such as social housing and renewable energy schemes, which in turn have helped to increase the population and school numbers, and I would like to add myself, and the bringing of local jobs. So part five of the Land Reform Bill sets out the right to buy land to further sustainable development, and I am clear that this should include looking favourably on community purchase of land for community energy use. SCEC believe that community energy can and should, among other things, and I end with this quote, encourage people to act cooperatively to create sustainable communities and give everyone an equal opportunity to own and control shared assets democratically. And I again point our, our future vision to the Land Reform Bill and hope that that will be taken into account in that context. Thank you very much. Can I now invite Fergus Ewing to respond to the debate, Minister? Seven minutes or so, please. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, thanks are due to Mike McKenzie for uh, giving us the opportunity tonight to debate uh, community energy during Community Energy Fortnight, which is supported across the Chamber, and rightly so. Um, there was a prolonged um, discussion of the dancing ladies of Gia, about whom I had not heard before. I wondered at first if they were a sort of Caledonian equivalent of the Folly Berger, but uh, rapidly learnt that was not so. Uh, but we went on swiftly to, uh, to extol the benefits of community energy. And can I say that Mike McKenzie is, and I know this from my own knowledge, a doughty campaigner who has spent a huge amount of his time devoted to, uh, to helping communities take benefit of the resources on their doorstep. So I thank him very much for the work that he does and continues to do in this important area. Um, I want just first to respond to some points in case I omit to do so. Uh, a, and to answer Sarah Boyack, we are keen on extending permitting development rights. We're having a consultation in relation to air source heat pumps. However, if she wants to write to me about solar PV and small projects, then I undertake to give that consideration. And in principle, I think she's absolutely right that, you know, we don't want the work of our planners taken up with unnecessary applications. We want to remove that and let them get on with the more controversial issues. Um, Murdo Fraser um, said that communities that weren't in support of projects um, we're in a difficult situation. I mean, I, I think I would say to Mr. Fraser that he didn't give any examples of projects to which he was alluding. It may be because he, there is sensitivity, but if he wants to do that, then of course we can look at that. But I am hopeful that we will see that the um, Scottish Government good practice principles for shared ownership of onshore renewable energy developments 
um, the, a set of good practice principles, which, as it happens, I'm launching later this evening, uh, will set out very clearly the good practice in this regard, although I can assure him that already all CARES community applicants have to be properly constituted community groups, not for profit. Uh, and that I think it is true that there are communities where there are schemes that are delivering substantial returns, where not necessarily every member of the community actually supported the scheme originally. I don't know of many community members who you know, want to send back the money or the benefit, but he raises a point, but there weren't any examples there. So I think uh, that, well, okay. Martin Fraser. I'm grateful to the Minister for coming away. I'm very happy to write to the Minister with some specific examples. I didn't want to, in the Chamber, uh, embarrass any individuals by naming them, but I'm very happy to, to write to the Minister if he wants to investigate the matter further. Minister? Well, I, I'm happy to receive such correspondence, but I hope the launch of the shared ownership principle should help to avoid any such issues by promoting good practice. And I think the overall message that we got from Mr Fraser and others, Mr Fraser referred to a calendar community scheme which is delivering up to 2.85 million over 20 years and which uh, I believe uh, may help fund uh, a, a matters including um, new businesses, transport links for health service, helping young people. Um, I can mention many other projects in Mull and Point and Sandwick. Uh, Liam MacArthur mentioned many in his constituency which is in many ways the renewables capital of Scotland. Uh, Alison Johnson referred to Harlaw Hydro, which I had the pleasure of opening three weeks ago. I, I didn't know that she was a shareholder, but, uh, uh, you know, but good luck. A, a good commercial return is being promised, I understand, from the, the Development Trust. Um, and uh, Sarah Boyack mentioned, uh, Claudia Beamish, Sheikh Brody, all mentioned examples of communities around the country that are benefiting 140 schemes, 9 million a year, and it's also not just the money, it's the empowerment of communities working together for a common purpose. I think brings many people in communities together for a common purpose and a sense of creating something, a legacy for children at the Harlow Hydro Opening Service. The local primary school's children sang a song which they'd written for the occasion. And there was something quite uh, uh, moving about the occasion of creating a benefit that will last for you know, 100 years. Liam MacArthur, Liam MacArthur. Of Reluctant to intervene, I'm, I'm grateful to the Minister for taking the intervention. I, I, I suggested in my own remarks that there is, I think, an important distinction between community-based uh, projects and, and, and individual projects, both of whom I undoubtedly, I think, deliver benefits for the community, but they deliver different types of benefits. By having that global target of 400, 500 megawatt, megawatts for, for community and individual projects, is he able to uh, give the, 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 the Chamber a, a sense of what the breakdown is in terms terms of community projects as opposed to individual projects and will maybe undertake to, 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 in a sense, separate out those two uh, when referring to that target in future? Minister? Um, well, I can, I can come back to Ms MacArthur maybe later, later in the week in the second debate, the uh, more full debate we'll be having on that. Um, I mean, I, I, w I can say that, uh, of course, there's community benefit and there's community ownership. We support both, but I think community ownership is something that we, we really aspire to as the, as the best option possible. And uh, in the, a, the uh, good practice principles, there are three options really about who ultimately owns the, the project. There is a joint venture, a shared revenue, and a split ownership model. Uh, and each of these are appropriate in different occasions. And flexibility is, is very much part of what we wish to uh, encourage uh, communities. Um, CARES has been mentioned by Mr. Fraser in particular. And I just want to extol the, the practical benefits of care, which provides, first of all, information, a start-up grant of up to £20,000, framework contractors to support communities, the Local Energy Scotland has contractors who really go around Scotland, experts helping communities, great human skills as well to navigate some of the differing views in communities too, a pre-planning planning loan of up to 150000 developer officer network again with Local Energy Scotland, and a CARES toolkit for community investment module. I mean, I've mentioned these in about a minute. In fact, this represents thousands of hours of work, of painstaking work. Uh, we encourage commercial developers to go for community ownership, and I think that's a good thing. The less positive news, sadly, is the attack by the UK government on renewables. Um, reference was made to a report which says that uh, 
the, to the renewables get more support than they should. Well, the level of support was actually set by the UK government not so very long ago. So I don't think you can have it both ways. Um, presiding officer, I don't think in the time I've got, I can go over all of the concerns we have about the attack on FITS, the um, inhibiting of the Green Investment Bank from supporting aggregated community projects, the removal of pre-accreditation, which is going to create uncertainty and confusion and already is in investors. But the key message here is that we are, I think almost all of us, or all of us, in support of community projects. The frustration is that in Westminster, recent policy decisions, which perhaps we can come back and debate in more detail as another occasion, we fear will have the effect of inhibiting and perhaps even black blocking community projects just at the time when I sense that there's a real momentum in Scotland behind these projects because more and more communities in Scotland have seen that they work and deliver enormous benefits. So it's above politics. It would be truly tragic if at a time when we are just beginning to see the community energy movement start to gain uh, an unstoppable momentum if it was caught in its tracks because of the lack of support by Westminster. So I hope we can uh, debate uh, those particular matters perhaps later in the week. But I finish by commending Mike McKenzie and everybody who's taken part in the debate for their support of community energy in Scotland. Thank you. Many thanks, Minister. And that concludes Mike McKenzie's debate on community energy fortnight 2015. And I now close this meeting of Parliament.